Hello everyone. We are just a few days past the official start of summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, so I thought it would be a good time to share the garden tasks that I am tackling at the beginning of summer, so June and July. And the first task is planting. Here in Ohio, I am still trying to get warm season crops into the ground. Now with a first estimated fall frost date of mid-October, I have a nice long window of warm season growing. Now I try to get the bulk of those warm season frost tender crops into the ground the second half of May. But some years things do not go to plan and I'm always planting successions of those quicker maturity items like bush beans or zucchini. This year is definitely one of those years where things did not go to plan. The second half of May, when I would normally be planting things out, was much warmer and drier than usual. And rather than risk stressing my transplants or risking seed not germinating, I decided to stall planting until the weather improved slightly. My corn, squash, melons, and cucumbers weren't planted out till the second week of June. And I'm still working on some stragglers, like some late started tomatoes I have yet to transplant. In a normal year, when I actually get my crops into the ground on time, the month of June still sees me doing those succession sowings. I mentioned those beans and summer squash or zucchini, and sometimes I'll do successions of cucumbers, basil, okra, and lots of warm season cover crops like buckwheat, cowpeas, and sorghum sudan grass. During the month of July, I then have to pivot into cool season gardening mode, at least in a planning sense. July is the month I start planting indoors for the fall garden. I start brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage, as well as bulb fennel within the first two weeks of the month. I also direct sow peas as well as longer maturity root crops like carrots and beets, rutabaga, and storage turnips. Now it may seem a little early, but planting these crops in July ensures that they are maturing during the cooler weather of fall, which is optimal. Now the second task is harvesting. Even with all of this planning and planting still going on, for the crops that I planted earlier this spring, many of them are maturing and ready for picking right now. Quite a few of my cool season veggies are behind this year due to the weather, and many of the veggies that I would normally be picking in early June are just now maturing. I'm finishing up picking the last of the peas, harvesting broccoli, cabbage, and kohlrabi. Cauliflower is running behind, but should be harvestable within the next couple of weeks, though my sprouting type cauliflowers, which mature earlier, are ready now. Luckily, I've got a few tough lettuces which made it through that hot, dry spell without bolting, so I'm able to pick those now as well. And my beets and carrots are starting to come on. I've been pulling up the smallest ones and snacking on them right in the garden. And I grow quite a lot, too much in fact for us to be able to eat it all fresh. So my third big task of early summer is starting to preserve the harvest. I end up freezing a lot of my early season veggies. Unfortunately, I didn't get enough peas to freeze this year, but any extra broccoli or cauliflower that I have will be blanched, iced, and frozen in vacuum style bags. I found that this is the quickest, easiest, and tastiest way to preserve these crops. I also like to use my extra cabbage to make sauerkraut or curtido, and my Chinese cabbage for kimchi. And for my beets and carrots, if I'm not pickling them, I typically just snap off the greens, and those can be eaten too. I don't wash them, and I just throw them in open plastic bags into the crisper drawer of the refrigerator. They will typically keep for months this way. Now, once these spring crops are all harvested and done, it is time for the next big task of the season. But first, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Green Chef. Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic company. It's a meal kit delivery service that provides meal options for every lifestyle. Keto and paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. I like to opt for the keto and paleo option, and for tonight's dinner, I'm making the creamy paprika shrimp. With Green Chef, I get farm fresh organic produce and premium proteins like the shrimp in tonight's dinner. So I can feel good about what I'm eating and how it got to my table, 
even when it's not coming out of my own garden. This is the busiest time of the year in my garden, and there are days when the last thing I feel like doing after working outside till sundown is figuring out what to cook. Instead of giving up and opting for frozen pizza, I can select several healthy meals to have Green Chef take care of each week, have them ready to go in the fridge, and throw them together in about 30 minutes or less. And the best part, these meals are delicious. And the other best part, I don't have to go to the grocery store. And Green Chef actually offsets 100% of their delivery emissions and reduced food waste 23% as compared to your standard grocery. Now, if you are interested in trying out Green Chef for yourself, use my code GROWFULLY60 to get 60% off and free shipping. Go to greenchef.com or click in the link in the video description below for more details. Now, I'm going to finish this up and then get back to the gardening. Once my spring crops are harvested and done, it is time for bed cleanup and prep for fall. I'll remove those spent plants, leaving the root systems intact in the ground when possible, and either go in and plant additional warm season crops. I'll often follow up brassicas with beans or things like peas and lettuces with summer squash and zucchini, or I will plant cover crop. Now, if I know that a bed is going to be used to plant some of my fall crops, I typically opt for a quick maturing cover crop. Something like buckwheat is often my go-to. But if that bed won't be planted again until the following season, I will opt for a longer maturity mix of cover crop types. Often things like sunflowers, sorghum sedan grass, or cowpeas. And this bed behind me, I'm testing out a mixture of cowpeas, millet, and annual rye grass just to see how it does. It's not a combination that I've used before, but I like to test out different cover crop mixtures and see how they work in my garden. Now, another task that I am woefully behind on this year is mulching. Typically, any of my beds that are not planted in cover crop will get a thick layer of a natural mulch. My go-to this time of year in vegetable beds are grass clippings. As we move into the hotter and drier part of the year, Mulch becomes especially important here for retaining moisture in the soil. This is something that I would typically try to have done in May, shortly after planting, but because it was so dry, the grass wasn't growing, so we didn't have much grass to harvest for mulch. We got a little bit of rain, so I am trying to get caught up now. I've also got to work on getting more wood chips down in my paths. There are some areas where it's been a couple of years since I've applied wood chips, and I can tell because the weeds are starting to pop back up through. And if you'd like more detail on the specific types of mulches that I use in my garden, be sure to check out this video. Now, it can become a vicious cycle. Because I was behind on the mulching, the weeds are starting to take over. Now, I will be honest, a small amount of weeding doesn't bother me. I think hand weeding actually affords me some time to get to know my garden a little better and to look at things more closely. I often spot things while weeding that might otherwise go unnoticed. The fact that the resident hummingbird is back, zooming over my head as I weed the zinnias, or the beginning signs of damage on my tomato leaves, signs that there is a hornworm at large and I'd better find him before he does more damage. It's really only when the weeds take over the garden that it becomes a chore and a drudgery and something that makes gardening no fun at all. For that reason, I really stay diligent about getting the mulch down because it really suppresses that weed growth. A big task for me this time of year is the preventative disease control. We typically have pretty humid summers here in Ohio. And from midsummer on, we often have conditions which are favorable to the spread of bacterial and fungal-driven plant diseases. Things like blights, mildews, and wilt can be the bane of a gardener's existence. And while it's not possible to control the weather or to control all of the conditions that lead to diseases, there are a few preventative steps that I like to make sure that I'm taking this time of year. First and foremost is keeping plants as healthy and stress-free as possible. Healthy plants are going to be able to withstand diseases much better, and for that matter, will attract fewer insect pests than stressed plants will. To achieve this, 
I focus on ensuring that my plants are receiving the proper amount of water and any additional nutrients that they might be missing, especially during those first few critical weeks when seedlings are just getting established. I also focus on plant spacing and air circulation. Many diseases which favor humid conditions also favor spaces with poor air circulation. Think tight, crowded plantings. For this reason, I always try to give my plants as much space as I can. I avoid or remove weeds growing up around the bases of plants and use selective pruning on things like tomatoes to open plants up and remove any foliage and branches which are touching the ground. Now, another reason to mulch, mulching can actually help prevent the spread of some diseases. Some common garden diseases like cucurbit downy mildew can be spread by infected soil splashing up onto plant foliage during rainfall or irrigation. Mulching can help prevent that soil splash up and both natural mulches or things like that plastic mulch film will work. Now related to this is to avoid overhead watering. It helps because it's gonna reduce or eliminate that soil splash up and avoids a situation of wet foliage. Overhead irrigation isn't always a bad thing and sometimes it's the only way to get the job done. I still rely on my sprinklers a lot to water the garden and of course we have rainfall too which acts the same way. But in times of increased disease pressure, it might be best to try to avoid it. And if you do overhead water, just avoid touching or handling plant foliage until it is fully dry, as this can help to reduce pathogen spread from diseased foliage to healthy foliage. And finally, some years I do rely on preventative treatments. Many of the diseases that I deal with here in Ohio are best dealt with before they even show up. For example, tomato diseases like early and late blight and septoria leaf spot are almost impossible to treat organically once they've got a foothold. I can slow the spread, but I'm not gonna totally stop it. And my tomatoes will typically begin a slow downhill descent. If you live in a high pressure area and tend to get these diseases every single season, like I do here, you might consider a preventative treatment. In the case of tomatoes, I like to go one of two routes. I either plant so many darn tomatoes that it doesn't matter if some or most get taken down by disease, or I use a preventative spray. In high pressure years, I typically opt for a combination of soap shield, which is a liquid copper solution, and a biofungicide like Garden Sentinel. I'm not a big fan of sprays in the garden, even organic ones, but I do like Garden Sentinel because it is a naturally derived bacteria that actually works with the plants to spur on their own natural immune response. Also, side note, something to think about before we get to this point in the year is that if you know you have trouble with specific diseases every year, late blight is a great example, seek out varieties that have built-in resistances. There have been a lot of great late blight resistant tomatoes introduced to the market in recent years. And I'm super excited because septoria leaf spot, which is one of my biggest problems here, there wasn't any real work being done with resistances, but in the last three or so years, there are some new ones on the market. So naturally, I gravitate towards those varieties because they tend to stay healthier here and mean that I don't have to treat them with anything. Another big task this time of year is pest patrol. Now, while the saying is true that if something is not eating your plants, your garden is not part of an ecosystem, that's not much consolation when hungry insects are ravaging your vegetable plants. And that can actually be a sign of an imbalanced ecosystem. True to the nature of gardening, just when I think I have one insect pest figured out, Mother Nature throws me a curveball. For example, cabbage worms were the number one insect pest that I dealt with in my garden for a long time. I finally figured out that simply covering the transplants with insect netting as soon as I put them out in the garden almost entirely stopped the adult cabbage whites from laying their eggs on the plants and I had beautiful clean brassicas with no chewing damage. Well, for some odd reason, the last several years, the cabbage whites have been very, very late to arrive, and I get through almost the entire cool season garden without dealing with those pests. Now, they have just showed up here, and I'm just starting to see damage, but I really didn't even need to net my plants this spring. But instead of the cabbage worms, 
I now am having issues with slugs, which I've not dealt with much before. As you can imagine, the insect netting does not stop slugs, but I have found that dusting my plants with diatomaceous earth does definitely slow them down. For some reason, the beer traps have never worked for me, but the diatomaceous earth does. Now, all of that to say that I am still figuring my way around insect pests. There is always a new one to deal with and there's always more to learn. I will not use synthetic insecticides in my garden because I believe in the long run they do more harm than good. But in the short term, it can be very frustrating dealing with some of these little buggers. What I find is that it is important this time of year to really pay attention to what is going on with the plants, because often I will spot a problem before it becomes a more serious problem, and I can actually do something to treat it. Now, some of my worst offenders right now include insects like cucumber beetles. Both the striped and spotted cucumber beetles are active here in Ohio, and both are the scourge of my summer garden. Their feeding damage is unsightly, but the main issue is that these little buggers spread bacterial wilt, a serious disease to members of the cucurbit family. While I've yet to perfect my defense against these beetles, I have found some tactics that help. The biggest one being providing a physical barrier between the plant surface and insect feeding. So early in the season, I will use insect netting to keep the beetles off my plants. Once they begin to flower, unless they are a parthenocarpic variety, I have to remove that netting so that the plants can be pollinated. At that point, I will switch to using surround kale and clay. It's a very fine clay product that you mix with water and spray on plants until they are thoroughly coated. And the reason this helps is because the beetles do not like the feel of that clay film on the plants, and a lot of times they will completely avoid feeding on those plants. In recent years, I've also been trying to research any cucurbit varieties which have either resistance to bacterial wilt or are less favorable to the cucumber beetles. They actually do like some varieties better than others. Now this can work, but it does work better in conjunction with planting out varieties that the cucumber beetles do like and basically using those as sacrificial plants. Cucumber beetles tend to be quite resistant to organic insecticides and even to some synthetic ones, so I don't even bother with trying to spray them. Another insect which has really done a number this year are the flea beetles. Now I have flea beetles every year, typically in the early spring on things like my radishes. This year, I think because it was so dry, they really, really have done a lot of feeding damage and are heavy on things like my potatoes, my eggplants, and my tomatillos. Now, early in the season, I opted for insect netting, and that seemed to help slow them down, but they are teeny tiny and eventually found their way under that netting. Often, plants will just grow out of the flea beetle feeding damage, but they're really doing a number this year. So this year, I'm actually opting for treating them with pyola, which is a pyrethrin-based insecticide. Now, even though pyola is naturally derived from a chrysanthemum extract, it doesn't mean that it's totally safe. Pyrethrin is actually toxic to honeybees and other insects. So I have to be very, very careful when I spray this. I will not spray it on anything that is blooming, and I will not spray it near anything else that is blooming when bees are actively foraging. And generally, I only treat it as kind of a last resort option. Now, in addition to the cucumber beetles, I have two other insect pests which love my cucurbit crops. These are the squash fine borer and squash bugs. Now, while cucumber beetles tend to focus primarily on cucumbers and muskmelons and cantaloupes, squash fine borer and squash bugs often gravitate towards winter squash, pumpkins, and summer squash and zucchini. Much like my tactics against the cucumber beetles, I find that a physical barrier tends to be most effective. Again, I keep my young plants netted until they start blooming, and if I can keep them covered with the surround kale and spray, that works pretty well. Last year, I actually tried aluminum foil collars on my pumpkins and winter squash, and I think that it helped, but it wasn't 100% effective. The trouble with borers is that once they get into the stem of your squash or your pumpkins, they can be very hard to treat. I've heard of folks getting in there and digging the larva out, 
and then mounding dirt back over the stem and it will actually heal over. We're actually injecting stems with BT to kill the squash vine borers. But these methods are not foolproof and I find that it's better just to avoid entry if at all possible. For these pests, you can actually plant a sacrificial or a trap crop as well. There are certain types of winter squash that they definitely favor. And if you have the room to plant those while also trying to take protective measures for the crops that you want, it can be more effective than using a single tactic. Another thing I do is scout almost daily for the eggs of boars or squash bugs on the underside of leaves. Any that I find, I squish and destroy immediately. Now, in addition to insect pests, there are always the ornery little animals that would love to make a meal of my garden. We seem to go in cycles here. There is at least one problem every year in the garden that makes me almost insane. This year, in addition to the weather, it is the animal pest. And the two are very likely related. I think that because it was so hot and dry, the animals were struggling to find food and water. And of course, this garden looks like a beautiful oasis to a hungry animal. Now, while I can't do anything to control the weather, the animals are pushing me to my limits this season. Now, I complained about moles in a prior video, but for several years after shooting that video, they weren't too much of a problem, more of just an annoyance once in a while. But they are back with a vengeance this year. There are tunnels under nearly every single vegetable bed in my garden. They're disrupting plant roots which is detrimental to the health of the plants. They are dropping seeds down into their tunnels so that those seeds can't germinate. The tunneling is so bad, in fact, that when I broke down and gave the garden a heavy watering when it was so dry, I actually found that all of the water was draining out of the mole tunnels and out of the garden. I was finding standing water out in the lawn from where those tunnels drain. So you can imagine if that's happening, my plant roots really aren't getting any of that water. I do feel guilty because I'm partially to blame. I've created this space, I've improved the soil, it's rich and loose and full of earthworms, so of course the moles are going to want to dig all over through this area. Now since shooting that original video, I've had tons of suggestions from folks on how to manage these critters, and I've tried quite a few of them. For a while, the mole chasing windmill actually seemed like the best solution. For about two seasons, it actually seemed to work. But then I don't know what happened. I guess maybe the moles got used to the vibration, but it didn't seem to bother them away and they all came back. I've tried neem pellets. I've tried flooding their tunnels. I've tried every brand of castor bean oil repellent on the market, I think. I tried juicy fruit gum, which by the way, that is a major garden myth. For those of you where this trick has worked, I am so glad it worked for you but I have a suspicion there may have been some other contributing factor. I have not tried running car exhaust down into their tunnels to fumigate them, although I have heard from a lot of you that that has worked. And since I shot that video, I have quit using poisons, mainly because of my concern for secondary poisoning of any predator that might find one of those moles and eat them. What I have found recently is another thing that was suggested in the comments of that video, and that is a scissors mole trap. I got myself a couple of those just a few weeks ago, and so far I've had really good success with them. I've already caught two moles. There are clearly more in the garden because I am still seeing fresh tunnels appearing, but I will continue with the scissors traps until I feel like I have remedied the problem. Now I'm also having trouble this year with birds snipping off seedlings. I've been delighted to discover several different nests of things like cardinals, robins, and song sparrows in the garden, and I get such joy out of watching the babies hatch and grow up. I like to have birds in the garden because some of them can be quite efficient at getting rid of insect pests, but it's a bit of a mixed blessing. Some birds, and I don't know if it's out of sheer curiosity or if they're actually mistaking the seedlings for something they might want to eat, will either come down and snip seedlings off nearly at ground level, or they will actually pull them out of the ground. Now, I know my dad has told me he's had issues for several years with birds pulling onion seedlings in particular out of the ground. He'll just find them several inches from where they were planted and he'll stick them back in the ground and eventually it stops. I've not had that happen here until this year. And in addition to the onions, I've noticed that with my watermelon seedlings in particular, 
they're snipping them off at the base. The first thing I tried was sticking metallic pinwheels into the beds near the plants, hoping that that reflection and that motion would scare the birds off. I think they just got used to them because eventually the damage continued. So I just resorted to using my trusty hoops covered with insect netting pinned to the ground. The birds can't get to the seedlings, and eventually, once those seedlings get established, the birds don't seem to have any interest in them any longer. Now, that's another story with my plants that are bearing fruit. Things like my blueberries, my elderberries, my black currants, my strawberries. There are many birds that will happily peck them completely clean of fruit. Again, the reflective pie pans and the tape and all that haven't seemed to work that well for me. The best method that I have is simply covering fruit plants with bird netting. It's not foolproof. I've had birds get under that netting and get trapped and I have to go in there and shoo them out, but it keeps the majority off so that at least I'm able to pick some of my berries. And the other critter who has become a major nuisance this year is chipmunks. We've always had chipmunks here. We live on a semi-wooded property. I see them scampering in and out of the woods all the time. But again, I think because of the weather, they seem to have all gravitated into my garden rather than staying in the woods like they typically would. Now with the chipmunks, I don't have a solution yet. I'm testing out methods. The insect netting works pretty well to keep them from nibbling seedlings or stealing seeds out of the ground. Obviously, it does not stop their tunneling, which can be quite destructive. I got myself one of the chipmunkinator, chipmunk live traps, and so far have only caught one chipmunk. And so my next tactic is testing out things that they don't like the smell of. So my Australian Shepherd is shedding right now, so I'm taking all of that hair that I brush out of him and stuffing it down chipmunk holes and putting it around the garden. I've heard that they don't like peppermint and that they don't like cedar mulch, so I'm going to be testing those out as well. But if anyone does have any foolproof ways for repelling chipmunks from the garden, I'd love to hear your suggestions. And because I'll probably get the question, we do have a lot of deer, rabbits, raccoons, and groundhogs here, all of which can be quite destructive in the garden. But knock on wood, I don't have a ton of problems with them here on my property. The fence has been very, very helpful in keeping rabbits and deer out. For fencing, I'm using five foot welded wire fencing all around the entire garden. And then I double layer that around the bottom with two foot chicken wire. Now this year I have been finding baby and like adolescent sized rabbits in the garden because they're finding little places where they can squeeze under or through the fencing, but they don't tend to cause much destruction. I typically will come out in the morning, find them, chase them out of the garden, and then that alerts me that there's some place around the fence that I need to take a look at and fix. I've not had an adult full-size rabbit get through the fence yet. Now we get deer through the backyard all the time, but in the what, five, four or five years since we've had this fence up, I've not had a deer try to jump the fence. They could obviously clear a five foot fence, but as I mentioned in another video, someone said that if they can't see a clear place to land, they probably won't jump, which I think is what is going on here. In any case, it's kept them out of the garden. Now raccoons and even groundhogs could climb up this fence and get in pretty easily if they wanted to. But I think that our two dogs do a pretty good job of scaring off any potential intruders out here. Now the gardens that I work on at my mom and dad's is a different story. We have no fencing up there. They have no outdoor dogs. So I've had major trouble with things like groundhogs and deer. Over there, I've pretty much resigned myself to the fact that if I plant anything, I'm going to have to cover it with hoops and insect netting. Um, sometimes I'll put insect fabric around tomato cages to keep the groundhogs and rabbits from nibbling off peppers and eggplant transplants. And just this year, I started using plant skid granular repellent. I was a little put off by it at first because it is quite expensive, but so far it has worked really, really well. This is the first year I've been able to plant seedlings out unprotected and not have the rabbits just decimate them. Well, I have got a lot to do, so I'm going to get back to it, but be sure to let me know what garden tasks you are tackling during this kind of end of June, month of July time period. And if you found today's video helpful, 
please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.